Where can uh, the Ukrainians and foreigners meet the ambassador of Canada in Kyiv? Oh, I can't answer that question. Canada needs friends with those interests and, and, and Ukraine is a, is a very important one. Canada is closer than you may think. <laughs>Here in Ukraine, I have not had uh, any negative issues as a result of, of being a woman. I am very often in the company of very um, important um, women in important positions. Uh, we are with our male colleagues and I always feel like I'm, I'm treated like an equal. So, uh, is the gap in uh, uh, countering those gender issues uh, big between Ukraine and Canada or is Ukraine gaining that uh, pace? just like Canada did? There are a number of ways to answer that uh, question. First, every country uh, goes through, is going through this issue in a way uh, that is relevant uh, for them. Uh, in Ukraine, the women's movement is very strong and Canada is extremely pleased to be able to support women's organizations in doing the work that they do. Uh, we find all over the world that women see issues and because they're the ones who have to live with them, whether it's education or in the healthcare sector or the ability to use public transit, they're also the ones trying to solve the problem. And what they're lacking often is resources. And so in many ways, Canada supports women's organizations with the resources to do what those women see is important to do in their communities and for their families. The second thing that I would say is that uh, when women are empowered, when women have equal access to the courts, uh, when they are treated equally by police, uh, when the challenges that they face are understood by the legal system, uh, when women are encouraged to go into uh, to, to, to take their excellent grades in, in high school science and technology and keep going in science and technology in their careers, um, that's not just good for that individual woman. It's good for the entirety of society. It's good for her family, it's good for her community, it's good for, for, for the country. I think that in the Ukrainian society sometimes problems occur when people distortedly interpret feminism, what feminism is. So how would you recommend uh, Tatiana and me uh, talk with uh, the people who do not understand why this is important and why feminism is important and what this is all about? When speaking with people who you disagree with, it's really important to find something to start the conversation on a point that you do agree on. And we've done the research, and in Ukraine, Ukrainians agree that men and women are equal. Ukrainians agree, Ukrainian men think women should be present in politics. In fact, they think that they should be more present in, in Ukrainian politics. So that's something you can agree on. How do you practically make sure that that equality is realized? And that's where you get into the discussion of where there are barriers to equality and what can be done. The challenge that we have isn't just the use of the word feminism, but that that inequality is entrenched in the systems of power that we have. And when you challenge systems of power, the people who have the power don't like that. And so someone might agree that women and men are equal, but if you challenge a system of power, they might not like that.
So when we're talking about making uh, equality of men and women go from sort of theoretical to practical reality, um, we want to look that women, to see that women are a part of the power structures, and we ask our quest, ourselves the question: Where are they, and where are they not? I think an interesting exercise is to look at pictures of your of, of your power structures in society, whether it's a parent council, a school board administration, a church council, um, cabinet of ministers, a negotiating a, 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 the, the negotiating team for a peace process. When you look at pictures of that, do you see the country? Do you see the diversity of the country? Do you see the power structure being shared equally? If you believe that men and women are equal, you have a very well-educated, very well-experienced uh, workforce and expertise. Do you see them reflected in those pictures? And if not, you don't go and attack the people who are in those pictures, but you start asking a question, why? Why can't women make themselves get onto those boards? Why can't women break into that sector? And that's when you start to uncover the systemic bias that exists in the structures that govern our societies. And uh, it's very illuminating once you start looking, uh, but it can be very threatening to people who hold the power. And that's why the final message in these conversations has to be that when men and women have equal access, equal representation, equal rights, equal pay, equal opportunities, it's better for all of society. All of society benefits, not just women. Madam Ambassador, you are a member of a G7 Ambassadors Reform Support Group that was created to support Ukraine in delivering reforms that um, will boost economic development. Do you always feel comfortable in meetings with the Ukrainian government officials when they assure you that all the reforms are fine, they're going in the right direction, with the right pace, and deeply inside you know that it, that's not always so? I always feel comfortable in those meetings because uh, I feel that um, we have uh, genuine, sincere, uh, forthright conversations with wh whomever we, we meet with, and it's a it's a it's a real privilege, I think, for uh, for the G7 ambassadors to have the kind of access that we do uh, to decision makers in, in Ukraine. And I have always said in my engagements that you know words are great, but actions is how we're going to judge. E what, what, what your intentions are. Uh, so some, you're right, sometimes the actions and the words uh, don't measure up and we find ways of, of having those conversations. We have built up good trust with our interlocutors and, uh, and, and we have those conversations. I think what people don't understand about governance is that no decision is easy. If a minister or a prime minister or a president is having to make a decision, it means de facto it is a difficult decision to make. And it's difficult because there are trade-offs, because there's no 100% obvious answer. There are always, always trade-offs. And so, uh, so this is what we understand as we, as the G7 ambassadors engage with uh, Ukrainian uh, interlocutors. Uh, and, and, and we are very clear that, the, that, 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 that our governments and, and, and their people will judge them by their actions. Uh, we cannot but uh, transmit the question from our common friend, uh, Michael Baturkiv. Michael, hello. Uh, uh, Ukraine for sure appreciates a lot uh, Canadian support uh, and uh, the support of its Western partners. Uh, however, uh, the homework that uh, the Ukrainian authorities, uh, that's what Tanya probably asked, uh, usually commit to do, is um, never fulfilled or is almost never done. So w when uh, can the uh, Canadian authorities and uh, the other G7 ambassadors uh, understand uh, and tell the Ukrainian authorities that enough is enough? And we're speaking about the Ukrainian authorities, but not about Ukraine overall. Sure. The answer is very simple. It's never appropriate for me to say enough is enough. Never. Um, but diplomacy is an art, an art of finding the right tone, 
the right volume, the right sharpness, the right priority with which to convey a message. And uh, in these conversations, in the last year that I've been a part of them, there is a variety of that volume and tone and uh, and I think we have a good understanding with our with our interlocutors uh, about how that works. Canadian policy towards Ukraine will be based on what Ukraine is doing, uh, what our interests are, how we can pursue those interests. If the court system in Ukraine works, there are great interests that we can pursue and we can encourage our investors to come here and companies to, to trade and, and real estate developers uh, to, to come and do their thing in Ukraine. If the court system doesn't work, we can't do that. Our investors will go somewhere else. And so uh, there's never saying enough is enough, but we, we, but we, we, we adjust as, as things change. And, that's how international relations work, and that's how diplomacy works. How is the uh, G7 ambassadors group interaction with Ukrainian authorities is um, organized? Who's forming the agenda? Uh, the, uh, it's chaired, the G7 ambassadors group is chaired by whoever's president of the G7. So last year it was uh, my colleague, uh, Chargé d'Affaires of the United States, Christina Queen, and this year it's Ambassador Melinda Simmons. The UK has the presidency of the G7. Um, we have, uh, every year we, we, we think again about what the priorities are and they're wide ranging and they're the support to the reforms. You know where they are, we know where they are and, and, and at G7 at, at some point during the year was, is, going to, is going to talk with uh, ministers, civil society, whoever, about them. Uh, we both request meetings with government officials and uh, re request meetings with, say, state-owned enterprise, the, the, the board of Ukrzaliznitsya or the board of the National Bank of, of Ukraine. Um, and they ask us for meetings. Uh, so it works, it works both ways. And, uh, and our colleagues in the British Embassy will be organizing that for us this year. I have to say we have very open and constructive dialogue with the president's office, with the president himself, and with the prime minister. So uh, we're, we have, we have, uh, we've had excellent discussions with them as a group. Are there different approaches or you are all on the same page? So actually, is there some common uh, negotiating positions or as there are seven countries, seven ambassadors representing seven different countries? Yes, yeah, seven, uh, seven different ambassadors representing interests of each of the country. Do they maybe point at some issues and do not point on, on, on the others or is there a common negotiating positions with the talks uh, with the Ukrainian government? Sure. So it's seven countries plus the European Union, we uh, always forget. which is uh, which is important uh, to remember because they're such an important partner to, to Ukraine. But I mean, from the very starting point, the fact that these are the G7 uh, ambassadors uh, means that we have uh, a common set of interests and that's the uh, political economic social success of, of of Ukraine and the reform agenda is set by the Ukrainian government uh, our engagement on that is in relation to the priorities that the Ukrainian government has and we engage on those uh, so uh, I, I we have a very uh, I don't want a, a very collaborative spirit among ambassadors. Uh, we talk issues out, and where bilaterally we might have our areas of focus where we where we push uh, more strongly. Uh, when we're as a group, uh, there is consensus on on what's important, and 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 and, and we share that stage as the G7, and not as a group of bilateral partners. And uh, what reforms are uh, of prior importance for Canada? Uh, for Canada right now and for uh, for the G7, I think as well, it's, uh, it's judicial reform. Uh, there's a moment, there's an opportunity, there's a need 
the risk is great, uh, the political will is there, uh, and so uh, that is a that is a, a high priority uh, right now. Uh, maintaining macro financial stability is really important uh, for uh, an important priority uh, for us. With to see that Ukraine is able to able to do that into the future, uh, and security sector reform as well. Uh, not only are we a G7 partner, but we're also a NATO partner, and the and the uh, the, the partnership uh, that Ukraine has and wants to deepen with. NATO is of direct interests to, um, to, to, to Canada. Uh, so that's something that, that we engage on as well with the SBU, with the Minister of Defence, with the RADA committees uh, working in this area, um, with the National Security Council, uh, with the President's advisors on national security. Uh, these are all, that's, that's all very, very important. Actually, foreign diplomats often talk about uh, judicial reform. It's a priority number one for everyone, and first of all, for Ukrainians. Uh, the banking sector is always mentioned, the land reform. Uh, what, they are, uh, what is rarely spoken is uh, something we call legalize, like legalization of marijuana. It's rarely spoken, but I think that Canada must be the easiest in speaking about that, because it has implemented that. Yes. Right. So <laughs> is it that that's scary as Ukrainians tend to think? Have you ever tried a product containing? I am marijuana? so not answering that question. No. Uh, <laughs> I think that uh, when it comes to the legalization of drugs, uh -huh. every country needs to find its own tolerances uh -huh. uh, with respect to its own society and needs to make its own uh, find it find its own way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, President Zelensky even uh, initiated the poll uh, in order to understand uh, the, uh, the temperature in the Ukrainian society. As Canada has already done this, uh, has the President tried to consult with you about this issue? You are the first people who have asked me about legalized marijuana in Ukraine in the year and two months that I've been here. Because so, it's in a, it is an agenda, in Ukrainian agenda. President organizes a poll to ask Ukrainians what do they think about that. And But he has a, an ally, Canada, who already did that. It, it's pretty logical to ask Canadians, to ask Canadian ambassador, how is it going? Are you happy with your decision to, legal, to legalize marijuana? I'm not sure that just because the president asks the question, it means that he has an agenda to do it. Uh, first of all, uh, we'll give him that. Um, but there are many countries who have dealt with this question of, of cannabis legalization in their systems and have legalized it to various respects, made it legal for different age groups, uh, in different formats, uh, for different purposes. Uh, so I think that if the president wanted to get into it, there are many, many of his allies who'd be able to give them, give him uh, advice on how they have dealt with this question in their own countries. Canada of today is one of the most successful countries in uh, combating coronavirus. It, uh, as far as I know, it invested about $800 million in um, uh, vaccine development programs. Have you been vaccinated already, or no. it's no, no, nobody? Has Ukraine really lags in uh, the vaccination issues, and uh, according to the recent poll conducted by the rating group, they show that 40% uh, of Ukrainians would never agree to be vaccinated, even if a the vaccine exists and b the vaccine is free. So, how does the Canadian government communicate the need uh, of the vaccination? Vaccines in Canada are commonplace. Children get them when they're born. There are some people, some families who still choose not to vaccinate their children, but we've developed, a, a, I think, a, a, a good way of, of talking about this. Um, and so the vaccine in and of itself, it's not a, it's not a scary uh, idea. Uh, but we understand that um, you know there are there's a lot of disinformation out there. So the first um, strategy I think is to teach people that they have to be careful about where they're getting their information. They need to check the sources. Uh, we have very strong public health authorities in Canada, and those are communicating about why vaccination is important. Now, because uh, Canadians, and I think populations all over the world are very well informed and have so much access to the information, to just tell them that 
it's okay isn't enough. This is new vaccine technology and there are a lot of efforts being made to explain the new vaccine technology to, uh, to Canadians. So the first thing is get your information from a good source. The second uh, angle, the second tactic, is to have credible people delivering the information. Uh, people that are trusted, uh, people that communicate uh, well, and people that uh, don't, you know, aren't offensive in how they deal with people who may disagree with them. So that's really important. The third uh, element is to have the institutions in place to rely on the institutions to generate uh, the knowledge and 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 to do the testing and we have those institutions in canada uh, and institutions have credibility in canada so with this vaccine one of the things one of the questions that canadians have is how is it possible to develop vaccine so quickly and so a lot of the answers, a lot of communication, a lot of time is being spent by authorities to explain how this vaccine, how we're going to make sure that this vaccine is as safe and as uh, effective as every vaccine that Health Canada has approved before even though it's been done really fast. And there are a number of very innovative things that were done in this process to speed it up. We're very much on track to get everyone who wants a vaccine vaccinated by September. I would like us to finish our conversation with some informal format. So I propose you to play a game. Uh, in these cards, there are uh, the text of Ukrainian songs translated into English. So would you like to choose one, guess what the song is, and maybe sing? <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Let's see. Let's see how well my parents taught me. <laughs> Could you please read? A, a guy convinces his girlfriend to go out at least just for a minute. <laughs> And so that she does not wet her bare feet in the cold dew, he promises to take her back home in his arms. I would not be able to guess that. <laughs> I don't know that one. You sing it. Do you know it? Yes, I do. Start singing it and see if it comes back to me. <laughs> There you go, you know what? I don't. That was that uh, for me. Let's try another one. Hold Let's on. try another one. I know the song, I just don't know how to sing it. A girl stood under a burning tree and combed her braids, saying goodbye to them. It's a wedding song to which the groom's mother removes the veil from the daughter in law. La 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 Exactly. <laughs> point, full point for that. Okay, yeah, very good. good. That was great. Who has not loved does not know sorrow. This is so classic Ukrainian. And I fell in love and did not have dinner and sleep at night. Okay, this is very sad. It's a very sad song. I think, is it? Okay, full point for that one. Okay, excellent. I'm redeeming myself. And to one. Okay, a guy apologizes to his loved one for not coming on a date because his younger sister hid the saddle and he could not ride the horse. Classic problem for a young man. <laughs> Too late to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a Um Is this... Uh, Yes? Yes. Excellent. Okay, I have one for you. 
Okay guys, thank you for watching us today. These were Polina Bochuk, Tetiana Hajduk and our very special, very interesting and excellent guest, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador of Canada to Ukraine, Miss Larissa Galadza. That was a great pleasure for us to meet you and to speak with you. Thank you very much. This month, Canada and Ukraine celebrate 29 years of diplomatic relations, and I'm uh, I'm really glad uh, that this is my first interview of the year, first interview of a really important year, and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. So, so stay safe and kind. Remember, Kyiv, not Kyiv, and see you soon. From Ukraine with love, 